I want to talk about the divisions of philosophy. Okay, and so let's let's begin with the term philosophy, which is a compound um, of two Greek words, philos and uh, sophia. And philos means something like um, like being a friend of or a lover of something, and sophia just means wisdom. And so what philosophy is, is the, uh, f who philosophers are, are people who are friends of the wise, or they're people who love wisdom, and they try to cultivate wisdom. Now, notice that they are not just sophists, that is, they are not people that claim to be wise. There's a whole other group of people who say, we are the wise people, like the seven sages or the or the sophists who say, they, we've actually got wisdom. Philosophers say, uh, we don't actually have wisdom, we just really like wisdom. In fact, we love wisdom. We have a, we have a desire for wisdom, even an erotic desire for wisdom. It's the most important thing to us. We care about it more than we care about um, riches or power or things like that. We want, we want wisdom instead of those other things. Or we think that wisdom is the key to getting those other things that people uh, think to be good. Now, we can divide philosophy into, uh, we create various divisions of philosophy, and essentially what we do is divide them into different kinds of sciences. So over here I've given you Aristotle's classical division of philosophy. His, his, his major division is between, on the one hand, theoretical philosophy, and on the other hand, practical philosophy. So Aristotle invented the distinction between theory and practice. That distinction had not been made prior to him, and he made this distinction and made it a distinction within the field of philosophy. Some things are theoretical, other things are practical. Theoretical sciences include theology, or the study of the gods, mathematics, or the study of mathematical entities, natural science, the study of natural things. Practical science includes things like ethics, economics, and politics. And the definition of these has to do with the ends for the sake of which those sciences are pursued. Theoretical science is pursued for no other reason than, or needs to be pursued for no other reason, than that it produces knowledge itself. So I can want to learn about God or want to learn about natural things, and I don't need to be able to do anything practical with that knowledge. That knowledge just is valuable to have in and of itself, according to Aristotle. Whereas practical sciences are undertaken for the sake we, we try to acquire those kinds of knowledge for the sake of doing or producing something. Um, so in the, in the case of ethics, let's say that the purpose of ethics is learning how to live well or to be happy or to be virtuous or to get pleasure or something like that. Well, we don't want to just know about what pleasure is. We want to enjoy pleasure. We don't just want to know what happiness is. We actually want to live well. Um, and economics, again, we don't just want to have a general theory about uh, wealth and poverty. We want to have much uh, substance, have, ha, ha, you know, have, uh, have a growing economy, have riches and so forth. Um, and politics, we don't want to just have a theory of law and order. We actually want to have a well-ordered society and so forth. So theoretical and practical sciences are undertaken for different reasons. And so they are different kinds of science in his view. Now, technically, he recognizes another classification of science. You might either think of it as a subdivision of practical science or on its own called productive science. And that includes all sciences which are undertaken not just for the sake of the knowledge itself and not just for the sake of doing something, but for the sake of producing something. For example, architecture we learn as a science for the sake of producing shelters from weather and intruders. And medicine is a productive science. We, we, we pursue it in order to learn how to 
improve health and reduce disease. And, um, and so we can, we can have a technical distinction between practical and productive sciences because practical sciences don't necessarily try to produce anything. They, they try to change the way, the, 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 what we do and how we act, whereas we, in theory, have a different classification of things that we make or produce. Yeah? Um, did Aristotle, did he set like theoretical science and practical sciences two different things, or is it that practical science is an applied version of theoretical science? Well, they interrelate. So there are ethics needs, for example, to borrow principles from natural science. Because, for example, um, if, if we're going to make an argument that what we should be doing as humans is trying to promote virtue or something, then we need to have a theory about human nature. And if we're going to have a theory about human nature, we need to study what humans are as natural beings and things like that. So they, they interrelate, but they are not, they, they are different. They are totally different, first of all, on the basis of their ends. Um, but they, um, they, they are not just applied, ethics is not just applied theology or something like that. These are actually different domains with different objects and, and so on. So they are, they, are, they are different on every level. Uh, every causal aspect of them is different. But the, the most important difference is the ends for the sake of which the knowledge is valuable is considered valuable. Yeah. Would you say that engineering or industry studies are like belong to productive science? Yeah, we would include those in productive science. That would be sort of like architecture. Go ahead. And the different question. So like in practical science, after we have knowledge, how do we put them into practice? Like what's the bridge? Well, for example, if we learn um, by studying ethics that um, justice requires repaying our debts, then, then we repay our our debt, and we don't. And, and if it requires not stealing, then we don't actually take money from our roommates' purse while they're not looking, and things like that. Now, that, those are very trivial examples, of course, but um, uh, but we do try to learn things about personal conduct and behavior and how. And, and managing households and resources and organizing society um, so that we can do things differently and, and ultimately so we can live better. Because I learned in um, a class in comp that comp says that the bridge between theoretical science and practical science is judgment. Is that the only argument or other philosophers have different opinions on that? Well, there are different kinds of judgments made, according to Aristotle, in theoretical science and practical science, and there are different standards of accuracy and precision that are required. So in mathematics, you have extremely precise requirements, we, and, and, and we would expect a precise demonstration of a mathematical proof, whereas in ethics, when we're talking about how a human should behave in a given situation, we cannot give something like a strict mathematical proof. We still make judgments, such and such is a good thing or a bad thing, or should be pursued or should be fled, but we have different standards for how that's proven, what kind of evidence is brought to bear on it, and so on. Uh, and, and so we can get into details about that later. Um, now, uh, but that, that division, I, I give you as a kind of classical division of philosophy, but it's not the standard one that Hellenistic philosophers pursue. They have a kind of simplified scheme, where um, philosophy is divided into three parts, uh, logic, physics, and ethics. Okay, And in Greek, the relevant terms are logos, physis, and ethos. Okay, Now, so let's start with logic. The Greek word logos literally means reason, Okay, but it also means things like word, argument, ratio, formula, speech. So it means a lot of different things. And the field of logic, in a way, relates to all of these. The easiest way to summarize it is that logic has to do with how we reason, okay? Including how we use language and how all of our different uses of language relate to reasoning, how we get definitions and so forth, how we make inferences, 
um, what we would call philosophy of language, linguistics, semantics, syntax, all of this is included within the ancient concept of logic, how we make proofs, what standards we have in different sciences. As I just said, we have different standards in theoretical sciences than we do in practical sciences. That's a logical matter according to the ancient classification. Um, what the relationship is between sensation and perception and experience and um, arts, crafts, techniques, sciences, wisdom, insights, intuition, uh, wisdom, and so forth. Also, dialectical uh, methods, um, rhetorical methods, criticism, poetics, all of this can be encompassed under ancient uh, logic. Now, uh, the second division, physics, in Greek, the word is physis. Are, do we have any physics majors here? OK, good. We're, we don't have to worry about any of those kind of people. Um, <laughs> but um, because I always trick physicists, because you're going to ask, find somebody you know who's a physicist and ask them, what does the word physics mean? OK, and I have never found a physics major at this great university that can answer that question. And the answer is that it means nature. What physics is about is nature. First of all, what is um, nature in general? But um, before trying to give a definition of that, it includes an examination of, for example, matter, space, time, elements or atoms, motion, um, the the nature of the cosmos. Is it infinite or finite? If it's finite, then what shape does it have? Um, is the What shape does the Earth have? Um, the nature of the stars, the sun and the moon, meteorological uh, things like um, rainfall, clouds, winds, earthquakes, volcanoes, um, plants and animals. Uh, and of course, humans, in a way, are natural things, since, you know, Humans, humans are animals, and humans are even kinds of plants. So humans are natural uh, things in a way. Um, for most of the Hellenistic schools, um, the gods are also treated under physics, because the gods are considered to be natural entities, not some kind of supernatural uh, entity. Uh, and so physics deals with all of those kinds of, um, all of, those kinds of topics. The last topic, um, ethics, Greek word is ethos, which means something like character, um, and it's related to a term that means habit, and ethics really has to do with your personal character and your personal habits, but it's in general a theory of personal conduct, virtues and excellences like um, temperance, self-control, courage, wisdom, Piety. Uh, I think I'm missing a couple. Um, but also things like how you relate to your family, how you manage a household, how you manage resources in general, so economics, leadership, politics, constitutional, constitution building and framing, legislation, uh, judicial, uh, uh, ju judicial judgment, um, and in general, um, happiness, prosperity, and success, trying to come up with a theory about what those things are and how we can attain them, what the purpose of human life is, what the meaning of living is, why we should go, first of all, whether we should go on trying to live, and then if so, why, um, that, those kind of questions. So. All of the schools of Hellenistic philosophy have views in each of these domains. And a Hellenistic philosophical school is an institution that has got well-developed theories in each one of these domains. OK, so any questions about that generally before I start giving an overview of <coughs> what their positions are in each of these domains? Yeah? Um, so emotions would fall under 
logic or ethics? Ethics, basically. But again, as in, as in the case of the interpenetration of theoretical and practical science for Aristotle, there is a logical aspect of ethics, so uh, of emotion. And there's also, by the way, a physical aspect of emotion. Okay, so suppose I was to define anger as boiling of blood in the region of the heart, as Aristotle does, or as firing of C4 fibers in some hemisphere of the brain, as, as we might do now. That would be like a physical definition of anger, a very reductionist or eliminativist one. But there is a physical component to, to anger. Right? And this is clear because it affects our bodies, and you might turn red, and it might make your heart race, and things like that. So there's a physical aspect to it. But there's also a kind of cognitive aspect to it. So de suppose we defined anger as a burning desire to repay pain for a perceived slight, or something like that. That also happens to be Aristotle's other definition of anger. OK, well, that's a kind of cognitive, logical definition of anger, of, of, of a, a sort of thought process that, that corresponds to being angry. And, and it's a definition. And so what is a definition? And what are the standards of definition? And how do we come up with those? And why isn't the physical definition enough? Why do we also need this cognitive definition? Or can we get rid of the cognitive definition and just focus on the physical part? Or maybe we can get rid of the physical part, and that's really irrelevant, and we focus on the cognitive part. So this is not meant to say that these, these are isolated spheres. In fact, they all constantly interpenetrate into one thing. And the Stoics um, have a bunch of metaphors to describe how this works. So they say things like, um, well, uh, logic, uh, uh, logic is the stone walls around a garden, and physics are the plants and the trees that are growing within it, and ethics are the fruits on those trees. Or again, they say that um, logic are the bones and sinews of the animal, while physics is, is the overall um, operation of these parts, and ethics is the soul of it. Um, and another one that I can't quite figure out why they say this, they compare it to an egg where logic is the outer shell of the egg and physics is the white part of it and, the, and, and ethics is the yolk. Somebody could do that for a research paper trying to figure out what the hell that, <laughs> that, that analogy means. I don't know. But the point of these is that they all uh, interrelate. But there is a question as to what order they should be studied in. And there's a big debate, as it were, a meta-philosophical debate about how should we, which one should we study first. So some people think, well, we should study logic first, because if the people can't reason and, and understand what definitions are and so forth, then they're not going to be able to learn anything else about philosophy. But um, physics-oriented people will say, we need to study physics first, because if we don't know what reality is, then we, we wouldn't be able to figure out how we can reason about it. Uh, and then other people say, no, you've got to teach ethics first, because if these people don't have ethics, you shouldn't even let them out of the classroom onto the street. You know? How do you know they're not going to be bad people? Uh, and so there's different positions on how those should be studied and in what order, and what is necessary to understand the other things. And there were developed pedagogies that attempted to present the schools in various ways. The Stoics had defenders of all three, uh, all, all, all permutations of what order they should be uh, studied in. Yeah? Could you just uh, repeat what ethos means? Well, it, it technically means character or habit, really. It's, it's, a, it's a sort of habit that you, habits that you have. And really what we're concerned with in ethics is, do you have habits like you're a self-controlled person or you're a courageous person? Or are you um, an indulgent person and a cowardly person? Those, those kind of things. Yeah. So the Stoics had proponents of all three. What about the other schools? Well, all schools have proponents of all three. I mean, these are just, you, you need to have some position on each of those to be a school, really. You need, to, you need some concept of reality, some idea about how we reason about it, and then some views about the, the end for um, humans. 
Um, it's just that with the Epicureans, the, the view laid out by the founder of the school, Epicurus, was not really modified. They thought, yes, that's the order that it should be studied in, essentially logic, physics, and ethics. Um, and, uh, but they have a totally different pedagogical theory about how people learn and how instruction works and what kinds of texts should be written to support that. So really, they have a totally different, different view about education. And that's why, and, and so they, they, they still, there's still a lot of developments within the school, but they don't, there aren't internal disputes about the order. So, I mean, card-carrying Stoics will have honest-to-goodness disputes about which of these should be studied and, and in what order. Yeah. So is the difference between logic and physics, I know this is much later, but it's kind of like the difference between the rationalists and the empiricists? No. The difference is that one studies reason and the other studies nature, and those are totally different things. They're just different objects, entirely. Because okay. I thought that was kind of similar to that difference. No, I mean, first of all, these are anachronistic terms, rationalists, empiricists, and so forth. This, these are terms of early modern philosophy, which we can relate to these ancient philosophical schools, but they're much later developments. But both rationalism and empiricism in the ancient sense would be theories of logic. There are theories about how we come to know things. Empiricism, we come to know things only through our sensations and perceptions of them. Rationalism, we come to know them through, uh, through, through modules and processes in our own minds. And so those are logical theories in the ancient sense. They're, they're, they're alternative and competing theories of logic. Yeah? I want to go back. So what's the definition of wisdom? Well, different philosophers have different definitions of wisdom. Aristotle's definition is that it's a combination of scientific knowledge and intellect or insight. Um, but we're going to be looking at a lot of different uh, different definitions of it. And do we do they agree on whether not, whether wisdom is useful or useless? Um, do, does who agree? Hellenistic philosophers. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the way the question's put is a bit awkward because, um, I mean, everybody thinks it's useful. Um, the, in fact, they all basically think it's an end. It's, it's, the, it, it's the reason you should do all other things. Um, so in most of these views, in the Stoic view, for example, it's coextensive with happiness itself. What it means to be prosperous, happy, or successful is to be wise, period. And the only people that are happy, successful, and prosperous are the wise. And everybody else is miserable, and horrible, <laughs> and stupid, and so forth. Okay. Um, now, there's other less stringent views than that, like ones where it's actually possible to be relatively wise, and or, or you know, to be wise in some respects, and and not in others. But um, for the, the, maybe the one thing that philosophers tend to agree on is that, um, yes, wisdom is a good thing and it's an end. They have total disagreements on what wisdom is, however. Okay, so that, that's really, in a way, that's, that's something we're going to be exploring in all the texts throughout the class. So it would not be easy to give a, 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 a brief answer to that. Yeah? Um, do the Stokes believe that all three were complementary to each other, or could there be inherent contradictions? Um, for the Stoics, there cannot possibly be any contradictions. They have a systematic philosophy. It's all interlocking. Every part of it has to be true. Um, if any one part turns out not to work, then the whole system falls apart. Um, and in general, in any given school, needs a consistent theory with all three, since they interpenetrate and interoperate, as I said. So if somebody modifies a view, for example, in logic or physics, then that would probably necessitate modifications in the, in the, other, in the other areas. Like a development within Stoicism that says, early Stoics say, there aren't parts of the souls, the parts of souls the soul is a unity, and 
some later Stoics said, no, there's actually an irrational and a rational part of the soul, and these parts are different. Well, that required developing a different, different theories about logic and about ethics and about theory of emotions, actually. So, but, but within any school, it has to be consistent. If your logic wasn't consistent with your physics, then you don't, you don't have a school. You don't, you don't have a coherent philosophy. So coherence is the first most important 